This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Mm. The Avoca boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Welcome to another episode of Safari Live. For the first time today, the wildebeest don't have damp coats as the rain has been upon us all day long, but it's finally starting to clear and the sun is burning away and filled with lots and lots of rain. Now, for those of you that have never joined us uh, on a Saturday Safari Lives, it's great to have you on board and you can talk to us. All you have to do is hashtag Safari Live or you can also talk to us via the YouTube chat. And we look forward to all of the questions that you will be asking us uh, this afternoon. Now, it's been pretty incredible the last week as well a number of cats leopards and lions of all different shapes and sizes have decided to pop on by this past week has been an interesting one the weather being mainly overcast and quite gloomy Tengana has taken full advantage of the cooler days and made his move back onto Juma, entering from the south. He walked his favorite route up the east, announcing to everybody that he is back. In the opposite corner, Shidulu has been faring quite well. She caught Stiernbork and ate it fairly close to camp on Tuesday. Tengana continued on his nightly patrol, but this time taking the path less traveled. Our new traverse on Torchwood has been excellent. We managed to locate Kuchava and her cub with the help of some squirrels and birds. The Nkuhuma Pride snuck in from the west and moved along the southern boundary, finding themselves a small meal along the way. Good afternoon from the bushwalk end of the fifth episode of Safari Lives. It's marvellous to have you here with us. Let me just tilt my head so that you may see my face in the sun which has just come out. It's very nice having the sun with us. Now, the reason we are wandering around this particular area is that there are many tracks of leopards. We've had tracks of Tundi and her cub around here. We think maybe she's got a kill. Also, we've had tracks of Tingana, and the last time I saw him on foot was just down there. So he does like this pan, and he is my featured character for the week. Tingana gives us a special treat on Sunday afternoon. He comes on to Juma after a week feasting on Impala in the Far East. It's a treat for a number of reasons. He is well fed and walking about without the limp in his left front foot. For me, and the rest of his fans, the best part, the old Duke is calling for the first time in a long while, telling all who care to listen that his day is not yet done. <laughs> So that was the old duke coming back onto his old dukedom and making a noise. And for many weeks we've been seeing his condition improve. We've watched him doing quite a lot of scent marking, but that's the first time we've actually heard him calling, which is fantastic. It was very exciting to have his rasping calls again. And clearly he's really not giving up. As I said in that little clip, uh, his day is not yet done. He's 12, or pushing 12, and it certainly... You know, that's, that's old for a male leopard. The record age for a male leopard in this area is a chap called the Camp Pan Male, who was 14. And he looked like, well, he didn't look good by the time he passed on. Tingana, however, I remember having that limp. Always had a limp in his left front foot from as long as I can remember. And I don't know if he just kept repeatedly injuring it or what the case was, but that's gone. So he's walking comfortably. He's hauling fully grown impalas up trees, which we'll show you a little later. And he seems to be absolutely fine, putting on condition and marking. So I think it's marvellous because, as many of you will know, I'm deeply excited uh, for the old-timer to come back in and restake his claim. Monique, we didn't see him, was it? Did we see him yesterday morning? Sorry, I missed that. Ah. 
Ah, Monique, yes, we saw him last night. We didn't see him this morning, and he disappeared into some thick bush. We did have some tracks around here earlier, so we'll just investigate if we don't find them again. But he's on the territorial prowl these days, and so he will move big distances. He's renowned for moving big distances at night when he's on his territorial prowl. And his main competition, Hukumori, the terrifying male leopard of the West, is actually mating at the moment, so he's very distracted and possibly that's why Tingana has taken it upon himself to come this far north and, in fact, to probably push off to the west. There were some tracks going that way. So he kind of walked his old, his old route. Uh, so that's very exciting stuff, I think. Anyway, that is the story of Tingana and his territorial movements at the moment. I'm going to head down into this drainage system here, see what we can find. Tristan has managed to find the most iconic animals. Well, James, I'm sure, as am I, is very, very relieved at the return of Tingana. And, well, it's a beautiful afternoon here in the Mara. As you can see, the plains are looking ever so dapper after a storm. The clouds have all gone away. And it's our favorite day of the week. And the reason why is because we get to come live to all of you from the Maasai Mara. So it's always a very, very special thing. Now, as James was mentioning with Tingana, it's from here. It's been really amazing to see him kind of bouncing back to his usual self, to see him sawing and walking and patrolling and scent marking is the most wonderful thing and for me makes me very very happy and hopefully it'll bring about quite a bit of stability to that area now there might have been boys down in Juma that have been making lots and lots of noise but here in the Mara we've had a couple of our own also voicing their opinion the musketeers are on the move with Scarface leading the way they make their way through the long grass with their black manes contrasting against the light grass one of the males is making his way towards Scarface and they begin a bout of bonding. Isn't this just so special? These boys don't spend that much time together so this is a real treat for us. After a day of resting in the shade we wait deep into the night for them to stir. They are beginning to yawn, a sure sign they are getting ready to move on a nightly patrol. Hopefully we'll even get a roar before they decide to do so. Wait, here we go. <laughs> Boys are now on the move into the night. This is just absolutely spectacular as they stroll into the darkness. The most incredible sight watching those boys coming through that long grass. It really was incredible. And I remember Manu and I, when we found them in the morning, we were very confused because they were all the way down in this area over here. Normally when we see these boys, they're up near this section of the river. They don't spend much time going further sort of south of this. And so to see them all the way down over here and to be all four together was just the most magical surprise. And we were really, really happy to see them. And we couldn't have timed it any better. We got there and they're all flat and sleeping in the grass. And all of a sudden, Scar started yawning and stood up and the rest of them all followed. And then they just came at us through the grass. And it was just one of those kind of quintessential African scenes that you always think about when you kind of think about male lions in East Africa is that long grass and these manes just blowing in the wind. And then to kind of go out into the night and spend the night with them. We had the most incredible sunset that evening. And then the stars came out and there was lightning in the distance. And we sat with the boys until very late. We, I think we were there until about half past 11 before they actually started to wake up. It was a pretty impressive sleeping that they managed to do. And they kind of then started to wake up and the, the roars started getting louder and louder and we had then all four of them at one point. Now, te Deadhead Tom, you say beautiful manes. They are probably the most beautiful manes out of most of the lions that I've seen in my life. They All four of them have incredible genetics. They've got these big, long manes and lots of black in them. They really are very, very, very special lions to see. And, and like I say, to see four together like that is just one of the most amazing things now the interesting part about it is that yesterday last night i spent some time out again and we had a sort of sounds of four lions roaring we couldn't tell if they were male or female from where we were but if it was the four musketeers because they're the only coalition of four that we know of they were down in this sort of area now you see there's a lot of kind of activity in this particular section at the moment you'll notice that there's three wildebeest yes we have seen three wildebeest here in the Maasai Mara it's cause for celebration those are the first three wildebeest that I've seen together in a herd besides the one that hangs around on one of the plains but that is the only wildebeest that are around but anyway there's lions that are all around this area and that's actually the area for the sausage tree pride and so 
we've been kind of monitoring the situation quite closely because there seems to be something happening. If all four musketeers have come together and they're sort of hanging around with one another and they're making a lot of noise and moving this far south, maybe, just maybe, there's some sort of intrusion happening or they've picked up the fact that there could be females in estrus around this area. So we'll just have to kind of monitor and see what goes on. That's going to mean a lot of trouble for our male that is in charge of the sausage tree pride with a little slit on his nose as well as the two young boys that are in that sausage tree pride. So lots happening there. Now our male lions are dealing with a sort of coalition and territories and all kinds of other things and we know Tingana has been doing the same and I wonder how James feels about his return to health. Well, as I said, I feel rather good about his return and why I'm hanging from this tree is because, uh, well, this week he gave us a tremendous display of a leopard strength. Now, it's taken all of my strength to do this. Tingana managed to do double his own weight. On Monday night, Tingana is on the prowl once more, this time for supper. Possibly distracted by the rutting males, an impala ewe falls victim to the duke. We often talk about the enormous power of the leopard, but seldom is it on such awesome display. So a boon time for the leopards at this time of the year, especially old Tingana. Nothing wrong with his strength, nothing wrong with his agility, possibly a little arthritic. He, he landed quite hard on that termite mound, I felt. And Ralph said, because I wasn't in that sighting, Ralph said he landed with a great thud and that it wasn't particularly uh, elegant. You also there, Seb. And he landed heavily, did he? Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's a heavy fellow I and mean, he's probably weighing in at just over 60 kilograms. But just astounding the way that, I mean, I, I was doing that genuinely to show you that it's, um, it, I mean, that's, that's the limit of my strength. I weigh about 67 kilos. And to, there is not a chance I would be able to do that with another 67 kilos on my back, which is basically what Tingana did, but with the same mass again in his mouth. Uh, really very impressive indeed. And, well, it's no wonder that people are in such awe of the strength of our cats. As I said there, I was quite surprised when I eventually saw the fact that the Impala was a female. I was surprised that it wasn't male, because of course this is male killing time, being the rut. We are going to get through this exceptionally tricky segment here of Bush, but Taylor is with what Tingana murdered. We are indeed with what Tingana murdered, James. And I agree with you, it is a bit unusual, but I, I suppose those gurgling sounds of the night that the Impala let off well, are becoming less and less now. And everybody seems to be quite relaxed at the moment. I'm surprised by this, even though their ears are obviously up, their eyes are wide open. That's the standard look for an Impala, as uh, if they're not careful, they'll end up getting caught just as Tingana has done. But very exciting. And this is a really good spot to try and find leopards. And Tandy, of course, was seen this morning on the move. And she was also stalking a herd of impala. She might be around here. This is one of her favorite areas. So we better keep an eye out and just uh, make sure we check to see if we can't find anything slinking through the grass. Now, another leopard that we got to see, which I was very excited about, is we've just started New Traverse on Torchwood. And that allowed us to find uh, Kuchava, who is... In fact, Tundi's oldest daughter, and she has got a, a young cub at the moment too. But they, they didn't catch an impala. She actually was using the drainage systems, moving around, and ended up catching herself a common daker when she took up a tomboiti tree and fed on for a couple of days. So it was really nice to sit with her, get to know her. But I think as time goes on and as that cub gets a little bit older, she's going to have to move on from the daker to something a little bit more of an impala size. There you go. They're all having dinner now. Right, we're going to keep on searching, I think, for leopards at some point, and hopefully around the next bend, we'll find one. Well, the search is on all day today. This morning we managed to catch up with 
Tandi, and it was a it was a bit of a fleeting encounter, and we also had a lot of rain as well. But um, she she was moving through the thickets, and she was also uh, obviously trying to hunt a little bit. So I've just been trying to relocate her this afternoon after the midday break, and there was a lot of rain, so um, she could have moved quite far. And well. That's what I'm looking for, but uh, it's always nice to search and find leopards. But um, something that also really excites me is when we, um, when we have the lions visit us, which is absolutely fascinating too. The Nkuhum has made an appearance this week, and in true lion fashion, were as energy efficient as ever. They groomed, yawned, stretched, and spent some time sharpening their claws. This will be useful going forward, as they look hungry, and I wouldn't be surprised if they make a kill shortly. With that many mouths to feed, it needs to be something substantial. Yes, yeah, so that was a very nice uh, time that we had with the uh, Unkahumas this week. And um, to top it all off, uh, we had them on a specific site and um, the vehicles went in and they couldn't find them. And I was out on foot yesterday, so I said, no worries, I'll go in there and see if I can relocate them. And it was uh, a very nice encounter after that as well. Lot, all of them is very flat um, and after having seen them with very uh, sort of... Um, empty bellies when we found them again the next morning on foot uh, they had uh, they had eaten uh, the night before so they were all then fat however we didn't find the carcass but they must have eaten something substantial uh, because the bellies were huge after that and then um, of course they disappeared once more and we now wait to see when they will return I think they went off onto Arethusa which is to our west and they'll probably be returning sometime quite soon. Now I'm heading towards Biffles Hook Dam. We'll have a look in there and see if there's any sign of the little goslings um, that have been going walkabout in the last little while. I wonder what's going on, but um, we will just continue searching for everything and anything we can find. Now, Tattooed Girl, you're wondering about uh, uh, different prides of lions. I'm not sure if you're asking about a different species of lions, like the Unkohumas versus uh, different lions that you may get in North America, like the mountain uh, Barbary, her Barbary lions. Well, these, these are the largest lions um, that you get in the world, and they also used to be um, the most diverse and most populated around the planet as well. Now the Herbari um, lions I, I don't know too much about and I think they're quite specific to uh, the, the place where they are found um, and as I say these lions we, we find them all over Africa um, and they are the most sociable lion as well or cat for that matter so they, um, they're the only ones that stay in large groups the other cats uh, bar the cheetah uh, they are normally all solitary so the cheetah, they do stay in small groups, uh, up to about five, like the musketeers in the Maasai Mara, but that is quite exceptional as well. Sometimes two or three coalitions, but generally all of the other cats, smaller than lions, uh, the lions that we get here, and they also are mostly solitary as well. Now, if you can see just up ahead of us here, there is a lot of clouds around. It has been raining this morning, quite a bit of unseasonal rain to, uh, on top of that as well. And, well, it's making things rather cool out here, and it's nice for predators to be able to move around at this time. Uh, normally, during the heat of the day, they would be quite relaxed, uh, just um, being energy efficient underneath the tree, in the shade. Oh, look what we've got down here at the dam. There's a, a small group of elephants coming down to the water. They've either been down at the water already, or they are just arriving. So let's go in here and have a look at Biffles Hook Dam. Wonderful. 
Oh, there's one that maybe just want to make his way up here, so I won't get in his way. Let's just maybe just move a little bit forward. They all got nice space for themselves to move, and then we can just stop there. How's that, Craig? It's a lovely spot. This next to Buffalo's Hook Dam. Look at these elephants coming through here. Small little breeding herd. Wonderful. And this is a lovely pan for them to come and drink. Quite a few females here with um, some young ones. There's a very small little one here coming quite close to us. There he is. Probably around a year old or so, that one. I'll just have to see it a little bit longer, maybe, maybe a little bit less than that. Always magical to be in the presence of elephants. And this, they look like they might be wanting to climb up the bank here. There we go. That's a little youngster with its sort of um, adolescent elderly sibling. Hello. I'm sorry for that poll. It's uh, obviously just because of the rain that we've been having. We do have our roofs on this afternoon just to make sure we don't get too wet. So lovely with elephants and hippos. There are some also in the dam here, um, but uh, we love to be next to water and hippos are always magical. Hello everyone and welcome to our sunset drive and hippos again with some with Ruff and also I got some hippos here. I've come back to my favorite uh, Chitua waterhole. I've not been here for a couple of days and I thought I won't come and find out what the hippos are doing. But above all, find out if by any chance our missing goslings would be here. Unfortunately, I have not seen any. But I've been being entertained by all the hippos. This place or this waterhole is always a beehive of activity. You got hippos, birds, you know, we had Ellie's earlier drinking, we had impalas drinking, we had the warthogs or the pigs drinking, and it has been very, very busy the last few minutes. Kingfishers also fishing, quite a spot to be, eh? Having started this morning with a lot of rain, it has now dried up. So it's a bit warm and you might see as we show you our exciting sightings today a bit of some pole on the way because we've got our roof on just not taking any chances we don't get more rains later hippos have just gone a little bit quiet but it has been very busy the last few minutes and all the activity here just reminded me of the royal wedding that has been going on in london you know i have i was watching it earlier there were different colors of people different shades and you know all the horses and this reminded me the hippos is a very ancient uh, greek word which means uh, a seahorse or a river horse and having seen those horses today I was like, okay, hippos, the horses, the royal wedding, what a combination. A great week it has been, and I just found out I was falling in love with a new leopardaster around here after liking Tingana previously. I meet Shidulu the leopardess barely five minutes after leaving camp. With a cold breeze blowing, this four-year-old girl enjoys the great views of her wilderness. She climbs down to eat a kid that she had hunted earlier. Not comfortable feasting here, she locates another marula tree close by and she stashes her steinbok dinner. Yes, and this new girl here, Shidulu, surprised me when she jumped up from the tree right down and started eating what I did not know. Just in case, my name is David, and on the camera with me is Fag. 
very exciting. Remember, we will want you to ask us questions. We'll keep talking, but by asking us questions, we'll talk to you more. As usual, hashtag Safari Live. And we're back to our hippos. Sorry, you might see a poll on the way. Should not worry, as I said earlier, because we might get some rains later. And Shidulu just jumped from that tree, went down. I did not know what she was eating. And just to notice much later, it was a steambok. And chances are she must had gotten it earlier. And we just sat there and thought Shidulu is behaving like a ninja. Up from the tree, right down and starting to eat something. Well, she didn't feel very comfortable eating there and she had to move. Quite exciting that sight I had with Shidulu. And oh, about Leopard this week, it has been very successful for all of us and Taylor, so the other girl who has a cub. I can't believe my luck this week. As David said, there have been plenty, plenty leopards around, and I've been fortunate enough to see, well, two of them. So it first started off with Tingana arriving back on the property, and I was, well, I was fairly surprised to see him scent marking so that's first started off as that one chilly morning and then the next minute he actually caught me off guard he started soaring and i haven't heard that rasping sound from tingana for a very very long time so that was so exciting and then it just didn't stop from there he carried on over the next couple of days but um another of course surprise like i said is is kuchava and the reason why I say it was such a surprise is because normally she's quite a shy cat and you just catch glimpses of her. But shy was everything but what she exhibited for us, which was really quite cool. And, um, and well, that little cub was pretty exciting as well. We've been seeing tiny tracks again around this area. Well, there's a bit of erosion you don't want to drive down into. There she is, Tandy! Yes! <laughs> you can't hide from us. I'm pretty sure that let's have a look and see. How exciting is that? Is it Tandy? Oh, she's chuffing. Is it a chopper maybe? I can't see now. Well, Tandy's got 3-3 three, three spot pattern. Of course, we're now... I wonder if it's Kuchava. Three, three spot pattern. Oh, there's a cub. There's a cub. Confusion sets in as I can't believe my eyes. A young leopard cub is staring straight at me. It's Kuchava's cub of only a few months old. Kuchava is preparing dinner and decides to hoist the daker in a tamboiti tree. Perhaps the whooping calls in the distance mean trouble. I hope you all had a chuckle just like I did. You know what it's like? I was so excited and we just crossed onto Torchwood following Tandy's tracks leading us straight in the direction of the Torchwood camp. And, uh, well, there were some tracks that turned back and went back into Juma. Anyways, not long after, after leaving those tracks, I think it was Aubrey that called in on the radio that he had some more female leopard tracks and I was like okay maybe I missed something maybe Tandy actually did sneak on past which wouldn't be the first time that she's done that to myself she does that to all of us she's quite good at it in fact and <laughs> then I heard all these birds alarming it was amazing and I thought okay maybe a raptor was always the first thing so I start scanning around to see if I can see maybe a battalier eagle maybe a tawny eagle or something sitting on the tops of the trees nothing and then I hear the squirrels going, and I think to myself, there's something here, there has to be something here. And we just drove on a little bit further, trying to poke our nose into the drainage line, and there it was, but not Tundi, Kuchava. Well, very exciting, I, I couldn't believe it. And then, the, I think the best part about that entire sighting was the fact that it was my first time seeing that cub, and obviously every other uh, time, Tristan, who got to see the cub when was only about two months old, very, very young, uh, it's now about four and a half months old. It's, it was so relaxed and didn't seem bothered with us at all. So, very exciting, don't you think? That this little one doesn't seem to be taking after mom. Mom can be a bit shy. 
Mm. Now, Ken, I'm, I'm not sure what Tandy and Kuchava would do to one another. I don't think it would be a very friendly greeting ceremony. I think there'll be some snarling and, and growling and perhaps some salivating. Tandy doesn't seem to tolerate uh, many things around her. And obviously, as I said to you uh, earlier, is that Kuchava is Tandy's oldest daughter. And what is that? That sounded very... I think I can hear... Maybe some very angry elephants in the distance. Sorry, Ken. That was so exciting. It was some trumpeting, but it might just be a bit too far away. Maybe a bit further south out of our traverse. Uh, anyways, so so I don't think it would be very pleasant. But um, even though they are related, that doesn't really mean much at all. Even though Tandy gave away a portion of her territory, well, they're both competing for the same food sources. So... They won't be too fond of one another. I think they will go their separate ways. There definitely won't be any running in and pouncing on one another. What's that straight ahead? Can you see that? 12 o'clock, well, 11 o'clock. Just in the distance next to the, to the left of the big marula. Who we got over there? Kudu. Very nice. A family of kudu. This might be a little bit too big to see any of the, any of the girls take down. But you know who has taken... A female could you down all by himself and that is Tumba now Tumba is another male leopard he's quite young and he is Tandy's son who is has recently had to just start dispersing there's a lot of pressure from all sorts of other males out here and they don't normally hang around so Tandy won't open a portion of her territory up like she did for Kuchava her daughter those boys go on the move and they can travel very very far distance away from where they were born before they settle on in but he it was absolutely incredible how he managed to do it I, I still I still can't believe it but he took down a fully grown kudu cow and she was pregnant too so he got two meals he did have the hyenas come through and steal it, however, but he managed to take the fetus up into the tree. So he did savour it for a little bit. Very, very exciting stuff. We'll see if we can get a closer view of these kudus, because that kudu bull at the back there with the big spiralled horns is absolutely stunning. And I know the Inkahumas will probably want to take something down like this. Now, we've just been following on with these elephants a little bit and this one just coming over to say hello hello little one hello how's it <laughs> that's quite nice hello yes such gentle giants aren't they and we're always sorry about that pole once again it's always just a, a shame when it's right in the middle there but um, otherwise these elephants so uh, we can't judge exactly where they're going to be walking so we just try to position ourselves nicely and then watch them feeding through and this group seems very relaxed after a nice little drink they're now starting to feed they also seem to want to after being rained on and probably cleaned by the water that's been splashing on them they sort of like to go and just brush their feet on the ground get some loose soil and then throw it over themselves. It's almost like a dog that's, you know, when you wash a dog with shampoo and then you let it go outside and it runs around and rolls in the, in the sand and tries to get all the old smells on it. That's the elephants seem to and do something similar as well. Joslyn, an elephant can weigh about 100 kilograms when it's born. So what would that be? That's a 220 pounds, um, up to about that. So it can be quite heavy, even uh, from the point of birth. And they do then go up to about between 6 and 8 tons, the largest elephants uh, being those of the Itosha National Park in Namibia. We're hearing a little bit of vocalization behind us where there's potentially some more elephants on their way, maybe coming for a drink. So we might be in the perfect spot here. Now, Aiden, who's seven years old, thanks for asking your question. Um, 
when these elephants do come close like this, I don't get scared because I've been around them so many times and I've spent yet many years following them as well. I just read the way that they, they, they're looking at us. If they shake their head and they're running up to the vehicle, then I will maybe be a little bit more nervous. But when they're calm like this and they're just eating and they're quite happy, then there's no problem. So I'm not nervous at all. Even if they come up and say hello, they're just being curious because they are very clever animals. So they also like to see what we are. No, it's, uh, I think I might go back down to the dam and just see if these other elephants arrive. And who knows, maybe there'll be all sorts as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Masai Mara. I'm really looking forward to uh, spending some time with you this afternoon after spending the week spending time with not the lion, not the hyena, not the leopard, but the cheetah. What exactly are you two boys getting up to now? Oh, it seems to be playtime. I love it when you guys start these antics. I wonder what their next move will be. No ways! Can you believe it? It's so cool that they're all the way up there. Well, at least two of them. Best you abandon this mission, young man. What a beautiful scene this is. Ooh. Now, coming down can sometimes be a bit messy, but she nails it. Well, how awesome was that? Now, there have been some major changes, and even though we've been very lucky this week, um, I just thought we would show you how much she's moved. Now, this would be her usual territory, right in the southwestern corner of the Mara Triangle. Uh, if we go any further south, to where the map becomes white, that is the border with Tanzania. Now, she apparently was seen on the border of Tanzania last week and actually crossed into Tanzania last week, but thankfully, this week, she's popped up quite far east of where we've been searching for her. So if we take a look at the map here, like I said, she used to spend time here. She's now moved 20 or 25 odd miles to this area, very close to one of the main bridges called the Purungat Bridge. And as you can see, there's been a lot of action over here. There's some hyena, a cheetah, a Thompson's gazelle that doesn't seem to be too healthy. There's a vehicle with a tow truck and actually not one, but two Tommies there. So we have been very, very lucky and we've spent a lot of time with Naratoy and her two boys who are approaching a year of age for any of you who may be new to Safari Live. So far more productive than the week before and literally Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, five days uh, we've spent with her. We sadly didn't spend any time with her on Wednesday and we didn't spend any time with her today. And I've got some slightly worrying news. Um, one of the main rangers from the uh, Mara Triangle gave me a call this morning and said that one of the young boys is missing. And Naratoy is desperately running around, calling, searching. So, who knows what happened last night? We left her heading off into the darkness with two boys uh, just after sunset. And we thought we would leave them be. And then given uh, a little bit of help to Tristan looking for the sausage tree bride. And obviously something must have happened during the course of the night. Whether it was lions or hyenas that disrupted the cheetah, possibly even a leopard that gave them a fright. Something's happened. I'm hoping the young boy has just run off and hidden and he's just battling to relocate with mom. But there is a chance that something more serious has happened to him. Hello to Aiden, just seven years old, and you would like to know if cheetah are related to leopards. Well, yes, they, they are related. They are both in the cat family. This is a leopard skull, and this is a cheetah skull. So you can see, Aiden, that the leopards are far bigger than the cheetahs, and even though they are related, um, they, they're also a little bit different. You get cats like lion and leopard, who are more closely related. Well, I'm battling to put this skull back together, as, it's, as I'm supposed to. Hmm. Not a very good job there, Aiden. Um, so you get animals like lions and leopards that are more closely related to one another, and you could, I guess you could say, the cheetah is a bit of a distant cousin. Very good. Well, like I said, we've got lots of uh, interesting updates that we are still going to let you know about here in the Masai Mara, but for now, we're heading you back down south to hear a few more tales about Kuchava. 
Well, there's a... Sorry, we're just trying to find it. There we go. There's a little crested barbet for you to have a look at. Or actually two bouncing around on the tree. And they... Well, the other one's already flown off. I'm hoping this one decides to stick around. And like those kudu we had a little earlier, they decided to give us a bit of a slip. Now, we've been having a bit of trouble trying to figure out whether a Kuchava's cub is a girl or a boy. I wonder what it is. Chava has been living up to her name this week, lying low with her youngster, making it difficult to sex the cub. The boldness of this youngster is starting to shine through and showing promising tree-climbing skills too. Finally, a good view of the cub and we can confidently say it's a little boy. Wonderful. Good work, James. He was the one that uh, managed to get Kuchava and, well, her little boy out in the open. Hey, those apricots are a dead giveaway. <laughs> so that's very exciting stuff from Kuchava. Her first cub, or what we know to be her first cub, and, and it's a little boy. He's becoming quite bold. And uh, I did enjoy watching him go up and down that Tamboti tree. He seems to be faring quite well now. And, well, he's only going to get better. And uh, let's see what his personality is going to be like. Is he going to be a, a klutzy clown like Tumba? <laughs> now, a great question from Marcy. Um, yes, that cub will know to hide from hyenas. It's been told by, by mum. Actually, I want to go this way. I don't know why I ended up going to the left. Uh, so, obviously, they're communicating with one another constantly. Mom doing most of the talking. The little one's supposed to be doing all of the listening. Sometimes it doesn't go according to plan, though. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting sighting. So, unfortunately, I didn't get to experience what happened, Marcy. But there was a hyena interaction between Kuchava shortly after we left. Now, if you had watched live that morning, uh, we could hear the whooping sounds of hyenas in the distance. And, uh, sure, they'd been going on for about half an hour, 45 minutes or so, and coming closer and closer. And you could clearly see that Kuchava got nervous at one point when she... Obviously, went underneath a fallen shrub. She grabbed the dacre, which I had no idea that she even had, hoisted it straight up the tree, and the cub completely disappeared. I didn't even see when it had disappeared. Where are you going, little birdie? Here's a crested Franklin. Here's one of the birds that actually alerted me to her presence. A little crested Franklin. So it was it was unbelievable how that all played out, and. She stood up there, she holding on to her dacre. I thought she'd wedged it in the fork of the tree quite nicely, but apparently that was not the case because the kill ended up dropping down to the ground and there were about four hyenas that grabbed a few scraps. She managed to get in there, though, and salvage m most of the kill, and she just took it back up to another tr Tamboti tree a little bit further into the drainage line. So at least she didn't lose it all, but I think a very valuable experience for her and her young male cub. Awesome. But off goes the little crested Franklin. I wonder, wonder where its pair or mate is. Normally there are two of them. Oh my goodness. Well, it's been a beautiful day for a bushwalk, that's for sure. And it seems as though James might be a little bit hungry. Um, we've just had 75 birthdays for a pair of ladybirds. Here they are. And Sebastian was just saying to me, goodness, James, don't you think that that thing has a spot pattern like Tingana's? And uh, <laughs> I had to say, no, no, I don't think it does. Uh, I'm, I'm talking rubbish. He didn't say anything of the, of the sort. But we have failed to find any further leopard tracks. So now we are looking at a gorgeous ladybird, which, of course, is a beetle. And what it seeks right now, other than the pinnacle of this grass stalk, is an aphid to eat. And of all the things my mother likes best in her garden, such as ladybirds, to eat the aphids that scourge her flowers. There we are. Now, we're not alone out here with this ladybird, which I'm going to put down. We're going to stand very slowly, and over the head of the magnificent Herbert Causer, <laughs> what you can see is a nyala, who is watching us, thinking, what on earth? are those clowns doing down there on the sand? 
Are they hunting? Are they looking for water, perhaps? Digging? Are they perhaps looking for tracks of a leopard? Oh, you see, I said the word leopard and he's off. He's disgusted. <laughs> Tesla, you would find that many of us are exactly the same as you. You say that... <laughs> that if you had to hunt for your dinner, you would probably starve. You know what? It's the same for all of us, except for people who've grown up having to hunt for their food. You don't know how to hunt because no one's ever taught you how to hunt. But you could do it if you had to do it. And, for example, Herbert, as a child, used to hunt Tesla. That's how he used to eat. He used to catch birds and small things to eat with his friends. And so if Herbert had to survive out here, of course, he could definitely do it. We're going to continue along this riverbed, see if we can't find any more tracks. Tandy apparently has headed off into Torchwood, so that's quite a long way from here, but maybe Tingana will be around. Now we've come back to Biffleshook Dam, uh, right up in the northeastern corner of the Juma Traverse. And as I suspected, the rest of this elephant herd have now joined us down here for a drink. They've obviously been hard at work feeding all day. And it's always wonderful to watch elephants when they do come down to water because they really enjoy it to the full. Everybody drinking and that one standing perfectly in this late afternoon light. Very pretty. And that lovely reflection and the shadows that's a youngster looks like a young bull a young teenager as he takes up you know probably bit about five liters of water or so and then uh, sprays it back into the back of his mouth watch that trunk as they slurp you can actually hear it sometimes it's like a Probably go for a little bit of soil as well. As I said earlier, they've been doing quite a bit of dust bathing after a lovely shower this morning. I get all their nice smells back from the soil. Looks like he's enjoying the afternoon sun as well. Almost looks like he's going for a sleep. And Jocelyn, yes, look at those relaxed eyes. It almost looks like he's having a little nap. But there we go now, it's nice and open. What's he thinking about? Huh? He's quite naughty. Yeah. Eyes are, it's like the all-seeing eyes. They really are. Now, Tanton Rock, yes, this was such a calming sight, but now we've... Uh, it just almost broken that tr tranquility with these um, hippos now getting a little bit anxious that these elephants are right next to them. There was a bit of argy-bargy going on there. I don't know what freaked them out, but uh, they're in close proximity to those elephants. And the one elephant now also thought, what's going on? Let me get ready to bail. <laughs> There's three hippos there, and they seem to be resident here in this Buffleshook pond. And the elephants now, having come drinking quite near to them, that one spraying water on itself. It is wonderful to sit with elephants. I really love it. So it seems relaxing sightings is the order of the day. I'm going to stay here with these elephants and see what happens in the meantime. Stay with the elephants there as I have been staying here with these beautiful stock, the sandal bill stock. Just look at the light, look at the position where he is, the water just waving slowly there. And the big bird reminds me of the girl Shidulu that I saw the other day. And Shidulu also gets very impatient with birds at the same time. Shidulu's swiftness and agility on the ground and in the air is fantastic. She enjoys her space and will not even entertain 
having birds near her. Wanting to have a quiet meal, this leopardess chooses to eat her standbok breakfast near some thickets on the ground. One thing I will respect Shidulu for from now going forth is her speed and how she would leap from one branch to another. It was amazing. Well, she is small being a female, but either way, she got some agility that I think is very special, comparing it maybe to Tingana that I have seen or to Tandi, I'll bet Tandi having a cab, but the speed should move from one branch to another or how she would leap up the tree with her kill. I think it was marvelous and I really respect her for that. From a distance, I'm not sure we can see some two hippos fighting way out there. I don't know how far that is, Fag. And it's a rotting season going on. And if you move to your left, I mean, there's an impala, sorry, my apologies. Uh, I don't know how far they are. If you move to your left, slowly towards the Samarula trees there. The two men are very good. I'm not sure they're going for each other or they just play fighting. Rotting season is on. And they could be going for each other to get some territory and maybe get some girls for themselves. Uh, chickening out. All right, let's see who will keep the girls. Okay, not willing, not sure if you want to have a go. Okay, maybe yes, maybe not. Yeah, there's one that's not certain and it's just chickening out. Okay. Yeah, one definitely is not up to it. And this also makes a very good uh, favorite meals for Shidulu. And it was so exciting to see her eat the steenbok, which initially we did not know what she was doing. And just coming up and jumping on the ground and to start eating without, wow, this girl is magic. And initially I thought she jumped on a scrub hair, which, you know, scrub hairs, once they are caught, their best predator protection is just to stay motionless. They just don't move, they stay where they are. And they think the predators will not see them, but leopards are very clever. And after a few minutes, you know, she lifts this steam book up and she's taking it up a tree and they're like, how clever are you? And most likely she must have hunted and killed it earlier in the day. Well, Impalas, you shouldn't want to give us another action. Monique, how are you today? And I hope you're enjoying that fight now, that the fact that you're not talking about Impalas now, Monique, we're talking about leopards. I asked my friends or my other fellow presenters in the camp and they guessed chances were it must have been a male, Monique, and you'd like to know which other leopard you think was calling after Tingana. And my colleagues told me most likely it must have been a male and they all guess it was Kijima. So I started with Kijima and being a male and slowly the territories could have been overlapping and that's why Tingana was feeling a little bit uncomfortable and he had to saw and let Kijima or any other male know he is still in charge. So Monique, my guess is it was Kijima. All right, still enjoying some nice entertainment here. And the one that looks to be ready for the fight now has chicken out and they're coming up maybe to the end of round one and hopefully they'll be back again on the stage they're going to have a little drink and a break and Ruff got some hippos well there's all sorts going on with these hippos I don't know if it's a family feud or what's going on um, but they are pushing and shoving each other around and doing a little bit of calling as well as um, they go about their daily business. It is heading later in towards the day now. 
Uh, Pradeep, who's six years old, thanks for your question. Um, well, hippos, they don't sing like you might see in some cartoons. But what they do do is, and I hope that we can actually hear them do it. They did it a minute ago, and it's like a... <laughs> and I hope I don't disturb them by doing that. Now, that's the kind of call that a hippo makes. And they'll come out at night and graze on the grass. So they don't eat fish or anything in the water. They only stay in the water because uh, they're quite susceptible to the sun. They can get sunburnt. So they stay in the water and they stay nice and cool and then in the evening or at night when it's dark they come out and they go and graze pretty much like a cow does. But uh, they can eat a lot more grass than a cow does. They've got a very wide mouth and they're able to pick off a lot of grass at once. Look at that big mouth of his, eh? And he needs a big mouth to be able to eat all that grass that uh, is going to keep that big fat body going every day. Now look at that mouth. Your. <laughs> Just having a nice time. They always seem to enjoy the water. And so these animals, they don't hunt anything at all. Uh, we do like to see animals that are hunting as well, but uh, carnivores to herbivores. Sorry about that, everybody. As you well know, we are broadcasting from two locations in Africa, high-definition signals all over the place, and that does bring with it a certain amount of complication. And so that is why you have come rather suddenly onto Bushwalk from the studio in the Maasai Mara. Phew! Now, I must apologise, because a little bit earlier on, when I was talking about Tingana, it was a little bit embarrassing, because I got my... Um, well, my highlights melded into one. So now you can become slightly more acquainted with what I was talking about when I spoke of Tingana's litheness. Tingana picks one of the last fruiting trees at Juma to stash his pantry in. A silly decision, and on Wednesday he faces the consequences as a herd of elephants in search of sweetness disturb his breakfast. The old boy demonstrates that he's still lithe and agile, albeit a little nervous of pachyderms. So you can see what I mean there. Now, of course, what I said earlier, you can make sense of. The old boy is still lithe, jumping out of the tree like that, and apparently, as Sebastian said earlier, he made a thumping noise as he landed. But, you know, we'll forgive him a little bit of a arthritic jumping at his age. There's a very small butterfly over here. And Karen, I think that's actually a really good thought. We're just going to see if we can see this butterfly while I address whether or not he may have been bitten by a snake. I think that's well possible, Karen. It's difficult to think of a disease out here, you know, like a sort of leopard flu, if you like, that would have laid him low for that length of time. And then you know, kind of gone away. Uh, I'm not sure that there are many natural diseases out here that do that to the cats or any of the other animals. I think normally they either wipe them out or they get over them pretty quickly because, you know, if they can't get over them quickly, then they can't eat and so they die quite fast. And it could well be that there was some kind of toxin going through his body, some kind of venom from a snake that uh, he just took the time to, to work through. Uh, some mildly venomous snake, perhaps. Could have been something as nasty as a... Well, I tell you what, it could have been something as nasty as a spitting cobra. But then we would have expected to see some necrosis, some kind of wound, some swelling, uh, an obvious limping. Uh, that limping on his left leg had been there for before he got sick. Um, so maybe it was something like that. It could also have been, I suppose, uh, a snouted cobra, which would have a neurotoxic venom, so there wouldn't have been an obvious uh, effect or, or obvious wound. 
but perhaps not powerful enough to actually kill him. A snouted cobra doesn't have the most powerful neurotoxic venom in the world, so that's possible. They're quite common around here. I don't think it was anything like a puff adder, which definitely would have resulted in an obvious suppurating wound, I think, as opposed to his general malaise, if you like. Anyway, the... <laughs> David, no, that wouldn't have happened. I don't know. I'm 99% sure that wouldn't have happened. You say maybe he stole a kill from a snake and that's how he would have got sick. Venom is actually not poisonous, quite interestingly. If you drink, uh, oh, drink, if you were to swallow some venom, as long as it didn't get into your bloodstream, the stomach acids would destroy it very fast. It would not be able to survive in the acidic regions of the stomach. So as long as you weren't cut in your esophagus or in your mouth, uh, snake venom probably wouldn't affect you. There are other ways for your uh, flesh to absorb venom, but really the chances of him being envenomated by a dead piece of prey that had been envenomated almost negligible to zero, I would say. You know, it's, it's possible, I suppose, but I think it's very, very unlikely. Um, I just think it's wonderful that the... <laughs> He picked the one tree in this place left that has fruit on it. The only tree that is guaranteed to be bringing elephants towards it. And that, of course, was a beautiful brown ivory tree. Careful this, um, Seb. Let's go back to the Mara now to have another look at the cheetah. So, welcome back to the Mara. And some in interesting stuff over there with James. Some of you will remember... A similar, not quite the same uh, theory that's been put out of Tingana possibly stealing a kill from a leopard, but I was lucky enough to see a mongoose steal a kill from a black mamba, and some of you were there to enjoy that as well. So who knows, anything is possible. Speaking of big cats hunting and going about getting their food, there seems to have been a lot of action down in the Mara, specifically with Naratoy chasing some of these critters. She's heading towards those gazelles in the long grass, but it seems like they have sent something. Here she goes. She singled out a youngster, but she's still got lots of work to do. She's gaining on it. She's got it. Now it's time to stash the kill in some cover, but the boys clearly have different plans and want to play with their food. Shame. The poor Tommy. Come on now, boys. Put it out of its misery. Shame. It certainly is uh, quite sad to see uh, the poor Thompson's gazelle having to bear the brunt of those two young boys learning the way of the wild. But I guess that is nature, and sometimes it is very difficult for all of us involved to watch. I know Manu and I were certainly not in a good state seeing that poor Tommy running around half eaten. Um, but it does show that uh, they do need to rely on their mother for a little bit more training. And they're getting to a point where in the next kind of three to four months, they could be on their own. That would be on the earlier side of th things to, to depart their mother's side. Um, but it will be interesting to see and continue following them as they grow and develop. I'm hoping it's still there. Like I said a little bit earlier, one was reported missing this morning. Sadly, we weren't out in the field, but I will definitely be heading all the way, basically. And this will be quite nice for those of you who are new. From our camp, which is all the way up here on the Mara Escarpment. So this green band indicates uh, a mountain. This is where our camp is. This car is upside down because it's broken at the moment. One of our three game views is broken. And basically we have to drive down into the reserve and then all the way down here. And then finally we get right to the southern edge of the reserve, very close to Tanzania. And that's where she was seen this morning and that's where she's hung out the whole week so hoping to go there tomorrow and find her with not one but two of her youngsters um, regarding hunting this week it's been quite interesting she's killed a lot of thompson's gazelle she's having a great time focusing on taking them down and on sunday she caught one on monday she caught one that we didn't see just after we left um, tuesday she caught another one Wednesday she caught another. She's basically caught a Thompson's gazelle every single day this week 
firing yesterday. And I'm told that she hasn't even been feeding on them and finishing them completely. So a lot of uh, joy and success uh, with, with her week and keeping the boys well fed. Some of you would like to know any updates on Malaika and her two boys. Sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, but no, I haven't heard anything. But probably a big reason why I haven't heard anything is because I'm probably not on Facebook as much as some of you might be. Um, this is the Mara River, the blue line that flows through the kind of center of the map. Everything to this side, which is to the west of the river, is the Mara Triangle. Everything to the east of the river is the Mara Reserve. And typically, um, Malaika would kind of hang around in this general area. She had quite a big range, and like all female cheetahs, not bound to territory. So I saw her all the way at Lookout Hill, and then all the way up in towards this area closer to the Talek River. So um, that's where she used to hang out. Where her two boys have gone, I am not too sure, but hopefully we will start spending more time on that side of the river and have some more updates on those two youngsters, on the five musketeers who are an incredible coalition of five male cheetah and a whole bunch of other characters that we would like to catch up with as soon as we can. But for now, we've got enough work cut out in the Mara Triangle. Very good. Enough from us up here. We're going to send you back down to James in South Africa. Here, a beautiful and perfectly formed water droplet on a knobthorn leaf that has succumbed to the winter cold. That's not why we brought you here. We just thought we'd give you some peace and some beauty before we showed you this. Marvellous! There is Tingana's dung. Is that not beautiful, everybody? Rest assured that you can be relieved that you are not sitting in the proximity to it that we are. The smell is quite appalling, but it is quite fresh. And so as the light fades, we're sort of, I suppose, hottish on the trail of the leopard that made this dung sometime during the day. So we do have his tracks. They are going along this little road here. Uh, so we'll try and catch up with him. I suspect we probably don't have enough light left, but maybe he'll turn up on the clearings near the camp uh, just after dark. That could be nice. There should be some impala there for him to hunt. Beautiful uh, bit of dung there. We can see he has been eating impala, which, of course, all of you know. That was interesting, Ali. Um... Guchava's father is rumoured to be not Tingana. Oh, Guchava's cub. Well, Guchava's cub, I don't know that anybody knows who the father is. It's possibly the quarantine male leopard, as far as I'm aware. Uh, he, of course, is Karula's son, so that would make him... Gosh, what would that make him to her? Her uncle. That would make him her uncle. Uh, OK, Seb, I think that's enough. People are probably feeling sick now. Uh, that would make him her uncle. Otherwise, it could be Tingana. Uh, <laughs> it could be Tingana, in which case the bloodline... Uh, no, because Tingana is part... No, we think of Vula. That's interesting, actually. Right, so let's go through this. Guchava's father, we think, was in Vula. Right. In fact, I think we're pretty sure of that. Uh, so if, uh, as was Quarantine's father, so if Guchava mated with Quarantine, she mated with her brother, half-brother, and uncle. Yes, that's what happened. Uh, if she mated with Tingana, well, then she mated possibly uh, with her father. It's all rather distressing, in fact. I... I, I feel quite, quite disturbed by what I've just said to you. She's either mated with her uncle, uh, who is also her brother, or she's mated with her father. Now, that is perfectly normal in cat, uh, in cat language or in cat society. Uh, I'm just getting the question, who is her uncle? Her uncle is quarantine. He is her uncle and her half-brother. If you can believe it, they share a father, but at the same time, um, Gutrava's grandmother well, <laughs> is the mother of quarantine. Isn't that amazing? Oh, this is like a really disgusting soap opera, but it's perfectly okay in the cats, and it is absolutely common, W. James, this inbreeding is very common in leopards, and apparently in lions too, and apparently it is perfectly safe for between three and six generations before you start to see some odd kind of uh, 
what should we say, traits coming out, like six paws, or at least six toes on one paw, and that sort of thing. Uh, so it would be perfectly fine. There would be no issue at all uh, physically for the cub at all. Let us go and have a look at the sunset after we've talked of incest and disgusting poo, and Taylor will give us her impressions of these things as well. <laughs> Shall we do it while we watch the sunset, though? We haven't quite got a clear gap just yet as we're on one of the main boundary roads that uh, sort of edges on Juma. And the reason why we have come down here is because I heard the Inkuhuma Pride of Lions is not too far away from the boundary. So best we keep checking in hope to, well, catch a glimpse of them. Now, of course, we're on a boundary road. We've got power lines. We've got civilian vehicles. Oh, it's all happening down here. The next thing we need is just a leopard or a lion to pop out. But here's a... I might have to do a little reversey. There we go, there's a little gap. Now, Paula, this is an interesting question. Um, I, I mean, from, from all the leopards that I've watched, it's typically I find the, the male leopard cubs that tend to stay at home a bit longer, you know, trying to make the most of mom catching dinner, and the, the females tend to go off. So... I'm not quite sure what happened with Tumba. Of course, there's, there's no rule written in stone when it comes to animals. Remember, they just do what they want when they want. And Tandy obviously came back into Estrus a little bit earlier and, and then we'll, we'll had her come, a cub. But uh, Tumba, Hosanna, all of these leopards that were, uh, were left home a little bit earlier, uh, some, well, like Hosanna, wasn't given a choice as Karula just disappeared. But um, they seem to be doing just fine. Isn't that lovely? Not quite the sunset just yet. I think we've got a little bit of time. But I'm hoping with all the clouds around tonight it'll make for a beautiful evening. And I'm glad to see that these clouds are disappearing now. A lot of them are burning away, so I expect to see some stars later on this evening. That's the joy as we come into winter. The weather and, well, the evenings are beautiful out here. But cold, but chilly, but beautiful clear skies with just the stars and the moon out, which is always quite nice. Shall we carry on? Do you know what I think we're going to do? I think we're actually going to turn around up ahead and probably go back down uh, the way we came. And uh, the reason why I want to do that is because I did hear some Franklin's alarming just a minute ago, so I want to go follow up on them. Right, well, speaking of birds alarming, David's got one, but I don't think it's making a sound. You never take any chances. Anytime you hear bats calling, you better follow them because they might lead you to something interesting. We, we have one stock here. It's not doing alarm calling, but it's doing something interesting. It's feeding. I'm not sure she just caught herself a fish. How lucky. Very patient, very slow, but very sure of what she is doing. Just like some of the herons, the stocks and the saddlebilly stock in particular is always a very, very patient bird. Always a waiter, doesn't rush slowly, goes, stops and waits and sees if there's any movement in the water. And then it just spikes with its long beak. She must have gotten herself a fish. Dinner is taken care of. I don't know how many pounds or ounces of fish she may have to eat to make her dinner, but she has been fishing there for the last five minutes. How quickly you swallow that? All right, back to the fishing expedition. Sorry, Kirsten. Johnny, you're saying awesome. Yes, I agree. And just look at the reflection of that stock in the water as she moves and she connects with the water with her beak, looking for more. Sometimes she'll just dig in and try and get any arthropods out of there. Very long legs they got, and that makes sure that their feathers are way clear out of the water.
And it's always very difficult to tell males from females unless you see them very closely and you look at the color of the eye, and that's what will give it away. Very unusual to see both of them together, the male and the female. You always see one or the other. And it got named the sandal stock because of that, like, black sandal on the beak. This heron just trying to interrupt the hunting or the fishing of the stock there. And let's find out what Taylor is doing or the elephants are doing. I can't believe we found elephants. I thought we were going to find flustered Franklins. Perhaps it was the elephants that disturbed the birds. But this is a fabulous afternoon that is turning into. First the sun sets and now, well, all these glorious elephants feeding away. Oh, that's quite a big, a big cow by the looks of it. She looks like she's got a massive bulge in her belly. I wonder if there's a young calf brewing inside there. Off she goes. But we're actually... Not quite surrounded by elephants at the moment, but we are in between a couple, and I can just hear a few more as they rustle it through the leaves. And I think if we're patient enough, we'll actually get a whole lot crossing just in front of us, which would be very, very nice to see. Now, I wonder if they've come from Red Dam at Arethusa, and I don't seem to be able to see any water. Oh, no, it does look like they've maybe had a drink trying to see if their mouths are wet and perhaps their trunks are wet. That's normally a giveaway. No, doesn't look like it. Maybe they had a drink earlier. Looks like a little bit darkness around the mouth, but nothing fairly recent. Mina Moon, no, I don't think that their long eyelashes obstruct their view. Those eyelashes are super important. Uh, obviously, when an elephant is feeding, sometimes they stick their entire heads into a tree and often they have prickles on them so that will help protect their eyes as well as all the dust we've seen elephants having mud baths and then covering themselves with sand you wouldn't want to get any of that in your eyes and sometimes they actually take trunkfuls of of the soil and they'll th throw it straight around their face and that's often because there's a lot of flies that hang around in those areas trying to get the moisture now there was a forktail drongo that was shouting quite a bit now it's stopped. There's a Franklin going. That's just doing its evening call. Maybe it was a bit of a territorial dispute amongst, uh, I almost said dragonflies. Not the dragonflies, the drongos. <laughs> I think that's what was happening there. Very nice. Now, I'm hoping that this herd of elephants is going to hang on around so that we can continue viewing them and there's a couple of young calves that I think will provide us with lots of entertainment so we just got to be patient well I hope Taylor is lucky and that the elephants do in fact hang around now I am currently holding a hyena skull and a cheetah skull now you can see that the two differ greatly in size and hyenas uh, have got one of the most powerful jaws in Africa. So for cheetah to come across them and uh, kind of confront them is not something that we see very often and it was something that I've never seen with Naratoy and her boys until very recently. What an awesome scene to arrive to. This young guy is making the most of the only high ground in the area. It's quite a hot day, so I'm guessing they're looking for some shade. But, as usual, the boys are full of their playful spirits. No ways. I've never seen these cheetah face off with a hyena, and I'm pleasantly surprised as to how they are sticking together. Woohoo! They have managed to send it packing. Well done, Naratoy. You are definitely leading the way, teaching the boys how to keep pesky hyena at bay. Well, what an awesome, awesome day out in the field that was. And as I'm sure a lot of you have worked out, it's not just myself and a lot of the sightings that we've been spending with Naratoy, but Tristan's also been joining. And that allows us to do two things, get some cool two shots of our vehicles and the characters that we spend time with, but also just increases our chances of having one of the vehicles in the right place to actually film action as and when it takes place. And that was something that did actually happen on Sunday. We were both in the same area and... Tristan actually allowed me to get ahead of the Thompson's Gazelle where the cheetah would have chased them towards and, uh, you know, weights in pole position there. But in fact, 
the way that the hunt ended up turning out was that Tristan and Manu ended up filming the takedown and not us. So we kind of have been spending a little bit of time out in the field together to just try and increase our chances of getting lucky. But really, really nice. It was the first time that I got to see this uh, cheetah family uh, ever confront hyena. I haven't spent much time in there uh, with them. Uh, which is understandable. Um, but it was really, really impressive to see how she kind of walked up towards him and the two boys had their kind of hackles and fur up and were definitely not taking any nonsense from that hyena. It'll be interesting to see what happens with any future encounters with them. So usually Cheetah will kind of move off and not confront hyena. But I remember early on in my career in the Sabi Sands, a hyena followed the scent trail of a cheetah, found where it was sleeping, and it started circling around the, the cheetah that was lying down. And just as it got kind of to full circle, the cheetah said, I've had enough of this, this is a male cheetah. And it ran out, legs bounding forward, and it actually walloped the hyena on the bottom. So some strange things do happen, Archer. There's no two ways about that. Very good. Now, as you'll see, let me show you a quick view to show you how the evening here is kind of progressing. And you can see it's kind of beginning to get a little bit darker out there. Quite gloomy weather at the mo moment. And Pam, you, you'd like to know how do cheetahs climb trees or how do they learn to climb trees? Well, I guess just like we learn how to walk. It just takes time and effort and they'll start climbing up a small pile of rocks or a termite mound or a fallen down tree. And as they get older and a little bit more experienced, you'll find that they become more and more adventurous and start taking more chances and therefore become better at possibly climbing trees. But you will notice that definitely one of the young boys wasn't as good as his brothers because he didn't make it up to the tree. That was from the first clip that we saw. Very good. You'll be glad to know that the elephants have obeyed Taylor and stuck around, and that is where you'll be heading to now. <laughs> I got lucky this time, Scott. <laughs> Normally, every time I ask the animals to stay around, and they've been doing that this afternoon, they just run away or fly away. Luckily, well, the elephants are not going to fly away because I don't think any of them have got big enough ears. So this youngster is just feeding towards the end of the herd, munching away. Ooh, that's a good mouthful of grass. Oh, it's lovely and green. Must have snuck its trunk right underneath that shrub to get all the grass that, well, has not been found just yet. Looks like a young boy. <laughs> oh, are you trying to make me frightened? That's not going to work, I'm afraid. If you were maybe about five and a half tons, or if I met your mother and she did that to me, perhaps I'd be a little bit more scared. But there we go. Not, not worrying with us too much, just moving on. And you might find that this young elephant bull is in the process of being, well, not quite chased out of the herd just yet, but he's starting to well, feel a little bit of independence, don't you think? The way he's not hanging around at mum's side anymore, the rest of the herd has actually moved on. There could be a couple more of his age around. I mean, I would put him at just over 10 years old, maybe 11 or 12 years old. Now, Brenda, something that we've actually seen, uh, well, sadly, very sadly, in fact, a number of different times out here, and we see it in Kenya, I've seen it in Zambia, is elephants that have got only half a trunk, or say they're missing the, the fingertips on their trunk, normally due to snares. Now, the chances of survival of those elephants is actually quite good. You'll be amazed at how to, uh, as to how these animals are able to adapt. It's pretty easy for them. And um, I remember, I've told, I think I've told a couple of you a very sad story about an elephant that's missing quite a large chunk of her trunk uh, down in the southern Sabi Sand, so a little way from where we are now. And I'm pretty sure she's dwarfed in size because she's not able to eat as much food as she, she should every single day. And that's about 5% of their body weight. Of course, it depends on the size of an elephant. That's to each individual. And... Her calf definitely is a lot older than it looks, and I think that's maybe because, again, she wasn't able to produce much milk while she was suckling it. So they are able to survive. Obviously, there's going to be a few consequences, but I think it's, it, it's not so bad. Remember, if they can't use their trunks too well, they can just walk up to the vegetation and bite it but that's and sort of strip the leaves that way but that's not the most effective way for feeding but they do overcome things like this and and they're intelligent enough to try and figure a way around it what are you doing i'm going to start to see more and more of this which is 
which is great. Elephants pushing trees over. That was just the little one, though, of course. <laughs> Your older brother could probably push down a tree much bigger than you. Brian, I'm trying to think of the exact term that you would use to describe uh, or what you would call the tips on the end of a, a elephant's trunk. I, I've always just called them little fingertips because that's what that's what they are. Kirsty in Final Control says the tippy trunk, and they are like two little fingers that can move around. See, look at that. See how it's able to twist and turn that stick. Not many creatures would be able to do that, and in Yala and in Impala most certainly wouldn't. Now, you can see how this elephant's behavior has changed. It's just because we're on a boundary road and there's obviously lots of cars coming up and down. Perhaps it doesn't li like the sound of the vehicles today. So just kind of staring at us, just making sure that we are aware that we know that I am here. Don't come too close, I'm not too happy today. But then going straight back in to straight back into feeding again wonderful david seems to be having lots of fun on chitwa finding you all sorts of wonderful things well i did not stop here for the crocs or the crocodiles we have there i stopped here because earlier I saw some two Egyptian geese flying in the water and as they settled I thought I would see other smaller Egyptian geese following them and just to notice it wasn't the Egyptian geese I was expecting and my heart sank a little bit and forgot my dream of seeing the goslings today because this could be my last water hole before I head back to camp but well either way uh, we got uh, two crocs there i guess a male and a female and i this is vladimir uh, yeah vladimir and boris and tells you the difference between reptiles and mammals as much as it's a bit chilly for me and fog where we are we feel a bit cold right fog mm, a little bit silly, yeah? yeah he says we got two layers or three layers on it tells you the big difference between mammals and crocs, mammals and reptiles, because these crocodiles here are still gathering the very last warmth from the substrate on that small island they are in this Chito waterhole. Ideally, they'll stay there until they think the temperatures have dropped so much from the soil or from the substrate there for them to either stay elsewhere, but as it is now, they'll want to get as much heat from the soil as possible huge huge and i had seen one trying to come down i'm sure it wanted to get some fish but it didn't it was not very successful Ruff is trying to get some cut wherever he is out there Yeah, we're on the lookout still for cats. Uh, it's been a little bit unsuccessful this afternoon in terms of finding anything fresh or any new signs of the cats moving around. So I've come to a different area that I haven't been to today, uh, right up into this uh, western section. And then I'm going to just go a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, into the central parts, go down um, Rebecca's and Zoe's and see if Shudulu is anywhere around if she's on the move It's the perfect time of the evening for her to be on her uh, patrol and as, as we drive now you can see it's starting to get rather moody in terms of the weather once again with these clouds closing in once more and I wonder if it's going to rain again this evening it uh, it had opened up for a while and now it seems to be closing in uh, all over again so that'll be interesting to see but um, we're keeping our jackets on it's nice and cool and getting colder as the hours move on and perfect predator weather though at the moment nice and cool so you know I always do want to uh, find up uh, some hyena tracks as well which I did just a bit previous and they're one of my favorite animals well hyenas has been a tough thing for us over the last few weeks given the amount of rain I know the Juma team has been complaining about the rain that they've had but luckily for us this week there has been a bit of a sort of break in the rain and that's meant that we've got to spend some time with some of our favorite little characters it's been a while since we have been to the den due to the rain I mean, it seems like business as usual today as the cubs greet one another sleep scratch and make sure they are well groomed for the day ahead Thank <laughs> you. 
One lucky cub is getting breakfast, much to the dismay of the others, including mom, as she shows off her best side for the camera. Paisley, meanwhile, comes to say hi to me before putting Settles in for a proper breakfast. Well, I must be honest, it's been a rather arduous task to try and figure out what's going on in the hyena world. Uh, Jamie is obviously on leave and she asked me to kind of fill in while she was away and it really is not easy to get to know all of them, but it was an absolutely wonderful kind of time spent at the den this week. Unfortunately, it did rain and that meant that we didn't get to spend too much more time during the course of the week, but it was really nice to kind of spend time there, get to know some of the little ones and they really are incredibly curious animals. It's incredible. You drive into this den and it literally is just an explosion of bodies out of the grass and they all come trotting straight towards the car and then it's this kind of game between all of the youngsters as to how to kind of play and to how to sort of get to the car first and then each one picks a spot and it's then about chewing as much as they can off the car as quick as possible from mud flaps to bull bars to the winch to everything and they just kind of go at it as much as they can now the female that was there was clever girl so she was suckling pudding and and they are kind of the ones that we see that a lot at the den themselves and they kind of spend a lot of time and she was the only one luckily getting some breakfast. Now Francis, you say, my, how they have grown. They have grown. It's incredible because when I first got you, actually the day I got to the Mara, I went with Jamie to the hyena den and got to see some of the little ones, particularly all of the sort of this generation here. So Izzy Trot, BFG, Paisley played, got to see all of them and they were still fairly dark around the leg areas and when I went back this week, they've all kind of gotten a whole bunch of spots that have popped out and lots of little personalities that are developing and it really is fun actually spending time there. I had the best morning with these guys. They are super curious but like I say, really naughty. You spend more time watching what's being taken off your vehicle than you actually do watching the hyenas themselves. The other bit of really good news is that I know Jamie a few weeks ago, she she spoke about a small little cub that she had seen and she wasn't just too sure who the mom was but we confirmed this week that it is Sawa. So Sawa as you can see has now added to her massive lineage as it is. So she has now had her eighth little one that has come out and, and we will hopefully be able to catch up with her a lot more and get some nice kind of sightings of her as we go but it's just amazing to see how Sawa is growing her family and whether or not she's going to be the sort of well, difference between Waffles and, and her kind of taking over the matriarch's sort of role is going to be quite interesting. With her having so many offspring, she's going to have a lot of kind of support from them and it's going to be a really interesting kind of development as we go. So it's going to be really cool. Now, I know a lot of you, and we were talking about hyenas, but we're going to jump a little bit. I know a lot of you have been asking about Lipstick and Blackie, which are the two male lions that we get in the Mara and they are across the river. They're not actually on our side in the triangle at the moment. But some of you will have known that Lipstick, unfortunately, was found dead this morning, and you're wondering about where Blackie is. I haven't heard anything. We weren't. We didn't spend too much time in the reserve this morning. We were prepping for this afternoon, so try and find out during the course of the next sort of while, and maybe next week we can give a bit of a better update. But I'd imagine he's around. I know he was seen during the course of this week, and so I'm pretty sure he's okay and kind of moving around. Good. We're going to, well, probably watch the last of the sun as it starts to set up here in the Mara. And while we do that, let's send you back across to Taylor McCurdy, who I think is still with those large pachyderms. We ended up leaving them because they gave us a slip. Can you believe that the largest land mammal can disappear into just some vegetation? Pretty amazing. Right. So we're going to jump off of the boundary road now and back onto Juma and something else that I've been doing today while I've been bumbling about searching for any signs of cats that I've been keeping a lookout for those Egyptian geese and I've been checking every single dam. The Egyptian geese gosling have been on a journey this week with their parents leading them away from Bivelsuk Dam. Unfortunately they can't fly yet and I bet they had no idea that they'd be walking so far over the next few days meandering along a drainage line that I've personally walked before, giving the goslings the perfect protection they need from the predators above. They arrived at Voyatella Dam, but didn't stay long, as now we can't seem to find them.
I don't know where they've gone. It's still such a mystery, those Egyptian geese. I'm sure they'll pop up eventually. I had a look at Treehouse Dam. I know David was doing his rounds this morning and he checked even Sydney's dam, which is not on our traverse, but we have a view of it. And with the recent rains that we've had, I think it would have topped up just perfectly for those young goslings to swim around in. Now, I'm wondering if they just haven't taken up refuge somewhere else, maybe maybe there's a pool a seasonal pan that's filled up that we don't know about that we just can't see you saw the route that they walked my goodness a lot of the places they went there's no water in sight especially while they were moving and they only got rain again last night so we'll keep our eyes out on the next few days i did check treehouse dam i've checked twin dams nobody maybe they've moved even further maybe they've gone back further north again perhaps they didn't like what they saw at voyatella dam Now, Jania, I haven't got too much more of an update about that uh, very thin line that's been uh, wandering uh, around and that we've been seeing. Um, so the last I heard, it was moving around on Chitwa and I think was going south from there. So I don't know if we'll be seeing that lion again, but uh, I haven't, you know, like I said, I haven't heard anything else from any of the other guys, but I'll always keep on asking as soon as I, um, well, bump into them. And somebody that I did bump into while on safari was Roy from Arethusa, and he gave me a very, very nice update. So we now have solved the mystery as to where Shadulu has been, because I don't know where she disappeared to after she devoured her her Stirnbok, she made a run for it. <laughs> Anyways, it seems as though she ran all the way to Elephant Plains and is frolicking around over there. Somebody that's also chasing a bit of tail is Hukumori, or should I say Tiani, another leopard of the Sabi sand, uh, is was chasing, well, Hukumori's tail. And they've been seen mating on Simbambili. So I think once they're finished mating, I think they may be finished actually now. It was a few days ago that this was all happening, or over the last few days. Is I think Hukumori is obviously going to come back and that is the leopard that came on in and, and kind of took over Tingana's territory extending here into, uh, into Juma and then of course onto the properties just south of us. So he's going to get a bit of a shock when he comes back and he smells Tingana, maybe he even hears Tingana. So the tables are going to turn. So I think next week on Safari Lives could be quite interesting so make sure you keep watching throughout the week so you stay up to date with all the happenings of the, the soap opera and the sabi sand whose eyes are those can you see those eyes Senzel? i wonder what they are i wonder if they're little bush babies let's see so straight back in there i can see two little eyes moving around you might be able to see him just behind those leaves. Behind those leaves, there's there's a tree. What are they? Oh, I think it's a genet. I think they're two genets. I can see black and white rings on the tail. You see things moving around there? Look at that. There they go, down into the grass. Now a genet, well, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute once we lose them. They're still there. Since they're just in, there's three. One, two, three. That's incredible. Do you want to go in? Senzel wants to go into infrared. We're going to give it a bash and see if that helps us. There we go. So we've got the special light on, an infrared light which the animals can't pick up. I'm going to assist though with my spotlight. I can spotlight genets. They're nocturnal creatures, so the light doesn't well affect their eyes like it would an impala. They're still there. I can see the odd eye shine every now and then. You see, I think it's too dark without the light. So I think this is helping just a little bit because they're quite far away. But you can see a bit of movement. They definitely have long tails and they're climbing up that tree, which makes me think that they are genets. There are not many other things out here that have got a long tail with black and white little rings around them. I wonder if they're youngsters. I don't think I've ever seen more than one genet at a time. Do you know what we're going to do, Senzo? Mm. I'm going to poke my nose just off road, just a little bit, not very much, but I think just so that I can try and get a better view. This little shrub is, is in the way, and I think if I go back, if I back up slightly, and just do that. There we go. Actually, 
So back there, there's another log. I'm going to keep my my light on it uh, to the right. There we go. And then center there. There we go. Those are Janets. They, they are little ones too. This is the first time they were, like I said, I saw three pairs of eyes. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not worried about, oh, was that mom with the little ones? Oh my goodness. This is what I absolutely love about safaris is that you see something new every single day. <laughs> Oh, look, there's a the little one. So it's mom with the little ones. Wow. And they don't seem to be running around. That would actually make sense why there's a forktail drongo shouting about. And Janets eat a variety of different things. So there, three eyes is what I saw. So it must be mom and two little ones. I actually don't even know what you would call a little Janet. Would it be a kit like a bat-eared fox? But maybe James will be able to help us. Oh, anybody. I can't. Like I said, I've never actually seen a little one. I wouldn't even, I would imagine they'd have one to three youngsters at a time. This is so cool. Now, Paula, this is all new to me. I've never seen anything like this before, so I, I'm not really sure how long a, a young Janet would stay with its mother for. I wouldn't imagine it's very long, maybe just a couple of weeks to a few months. I'm, I'm going to guess now, and I have got a mammals book which I can check up in a minute, but let's just enjoy this. Uh, while they're playing around, hopefully they come out again. Maybe, maybe three months or so before they'll be on their way and independent. I don't think that they'll be like lions or leopards that depend on their mothers for uh, um, or a little bit longer. That's so cool. This is the first time for everything. I think they've just ducked down now. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to send. A pin. I'm going to drop a pin here and mark my location because I wonder if they're not living in perhaps a fallen log that we just can't see behind all that tall grass. And now they've just disappeared. Well, at least they put on a little bit of a show. Very exciting stuff. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see them again. Amazing. We'll see if we can't get a, another view over here. Right, off you go to Jane, who I bet is just as excited as I am about these young Janet. I am quite excited at those young Janets, I must say. I, I, I wasn't quite so excited when I first saw them because I was in the middle of refinding some of my greatest friends, uh, the Thrips, which unfortunately have in the interim, uh, while Taylor was finding the Janet, seemed, they seem to have disappeared. Anyway, here I am back in the tent, everybody, because it's very dark outside. But I, I do enjoy my space in the tent here. It's very pleasant to be back. I'm going to continue looking for my thrip in here while I answer Puma's question as to whether or not there are restrictions to our movements on Torchwood. Uh, Puma, there are absolutely restrictions to movements on Torchwood. It basically goes like this. There can be two vehicles from Juma at any one time on Torchwood, uh, or two, yes, that's correct, so that can be from the lodges here, or one of us, uh, two and no more than that, and then if there are guests in camp there, then we don't go there, because obviously the landowners there like to keep the place, uh, well, quiet, they come here for some peace and quiet, and so if there are landowners there, then we stay off Torchwood, so that's basically how it works, and it's worked very nicely over the week. We've shared very nicely with Taxon and Aubrey, so that's been good. And, uh, well, that's why we're not there this week, because there's a landowner in camp enjoying some solitude, peace and quiet, without us going vroom, vroom, past. Uh, my thrip seems to have disappeared, which makes me very sad in my heart. So I'll keep trying to find this thrip, but I think I will fail. Anyway, we're going to talk of marshmallows and running animals now. Now, we have been spending some time over the past few weeks trying to... Now we've been spending some time over the past few weeks trying to get our migration sorted out and trying to understand exactly where the wildebeest are moving. And it's been quite difficult to be able to kind of find out exactly what's happening. Now, these small arrows that you see here, this is where the migration was last week. And in fact, one of our arrows has moved a little bit. So I'm going to need to change that slightly. But what's happened is some of the wildebeest have moved up towards the Grumeti River. They haven't crossed this river yet. Well, not that I've seen. I haven't heard of any crossings. 
and then a lot of them have actually gone back south again, back down to Indutu. So this whole area is just constantly raining, and there's even some thoughts and rumors that possibly because of the amount of rain that they've had, which is more rain than they've had since 93 or 96, that they might actually not even come too deep into the Mara this year, and that they might just kind of get into the northern Serengeti, just touch into the Mara and the Mara Triangle, and then turn back. So it's going to be really interesting to see what plays out over the next few weeks. We're going to have to hope that the rain starts to subside and that the wildebeest will then start crossing northwards towards the Mara Triangle. Now, hey Tristan, come help! I'm stuck. You might have heard that, but as you can see, there is a gentleman that is in need of my assistance, and this is not the first time this week. <laughs> occurrence and we've managed to save Scott not only from James the crocodile but also from the mud. It was highly entertaining. We did have a good giggle when we were there because we actually were parked quite far away and then I saw Scott and he wasn't really moving. He was just sitting still. And I, was, I got stuck in a place where I shouldn't have and Tristan believed in me and he told James on camera, no man, there's no way that Scott stuck there. The radio wasn't working. We were in a little bit of a valley. Not even the cell phones were working. So we kind of stewed for a while. You did stew actually. It was pretty funny. Yeah, I was glad that you were nearby. Yes, and also glad that you didn't take your head off with the recovery point when that broke off. Exactly, yeah. That's um, it can well. be quite treacherous at times, but thankfully we've got new tow ropes, and uh, those were definitely very, very useful with aiding in getting us out, and I'm sure you guys all enjoyed that behind-the-scenes affair getting stuck. There's guaranteed to be more, so don't worry, it's not the first nor the last. Very good, we're going to send you back down south to South Africa, and that will be goodbye from us in the Mara. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye! We'll hope to have chats with you guys soon, and it seems as though the Janets have also said goodbye. What a pity. But that's okay. I was really impressed that they didn't run away sooner. And we just tried to sit quietly and see if they'd come out. So I'm just having a quick scan around to see if I can see any more of those eyes. Nope. I think that they've gone now. But how awesome. First time I've ever seen young Janet. Amazing. I'm really chuffed with that. Still don't know what you call little Janets, though. I had a quick squiz in my mammals book. Hey. No. Sorry, I had a quick squ squiz of my mammals book. Molly, you said that Jenna can have up to five young. That's probably the maximum. Whether they have five young all the time, I highly doubt it. It's like leopards, for instance. I mean, leopards can have up to four cubs if they wanted to. But I've never seen a leopard with four cubs. I've only ever seen them with two before. But again, that's just my experience. So I don't know if they would have five all the time. I would imagine maybe two or three would be the most common amount but again that's my first sighting so who am i to judge we'll have to find out and i hope we get to spend a bit more time with them so that well i can watch them frolic about and maybe maybe watch them grow although I'd be, it'll be interesting to see what they're living in or you know are, are they old enough was that mom with them i did see one that looked quite um well a fair amount bigger uh, than the, the two so I think it could have been mom hanging around. Perhaps they haven't been weaned just yet. And uh, had a quick, like I said, had a look in the book. And it says that mm, they typically weaned at about 10 weeks old or so. I think those were large spotted genets. That's what we get up here. But um, you get two different kinds, the small spotted genet and the large spotted genet. And, well, to be honest, the only way you can really tell, because there's not much of a size difference, is, um, well, not, not a significant difference that I think you could tell by your eye, is that the one has got a black tip on the tail, and that is the large spotted genet. And then, of course, well, the small spotted genet has got a white tip on the tail. So we'll keep an eye out for them. 
again, I'm definitely going to be coming back to visit. I'm so excited. Right, somebody else, well, um, I don't actually know what James is doing. He's doing something. He might be he's either looking at the moon or perhaps he's howling at it. Let's go find out. Oh! Uh I found a thrip. There it is. Now, this is our new character. Last week, of course, we were introduced to the community nest spiders. I forget exactly what we called them. What did we call them? Cecilia, yes, she led them. But what did we call the clan of community nest spiders? We gave them a name. I forget. We'll call them the clavicle community nest spiders. This is an independent living organism or insect not in a community and his name is Thesiger. Thesiger the Thrip. Our newest Safari Live character. You can identify him by the fact that he has got four stripes on his abdomen as opposed to five which you would expect normally on a black thrip. He is being a little bit uh, unconfiding, Thesiger, where are you? Thesi! He's living on the, oh there he is, he's living on the plant that keeps on giving. Yes, Monique, I thought you might. You say, yay, a thrip. We discovered all of these thrips last year together, didn't we? Judy H and Monique and I and all the rest of you who have been subjected to my enthusiasm for thrips. Now, they're actually an agricultural pest, a lot of them. But obviously out here there's not a lot of agriculture. There are only a whole lot of uh, of this plant that keeps on giving. The Waltheria indica, on which the thrips live. Thrips and various other different kinds of creatures. So, that's Thesage of the Thrip, everybody. We'll watch him over the next four, uh, four years or so, see how he grows, see if he makes offspring. I must just... Uh, say with great relief of course that uh, clearly Tingana was mating with Guchava which is excellent news Mvula was her father Tingana is her consort and therefore uh, there is some fresh genetics coming with the little baby boy that we now have which is very special of course the time is going to come for us to name the little boy and all the political ramifications of that. We'll talk about them in due course, however. Let's go back to the Janet Hunter. <laughs> the Janet Hunter. <laughs> well, I wish we had those Janets out on the road foraging, but I don't think we will be too much more lucky. But we have found a spot of thickney. There was another one, but it flew away, and they're really funny at the moment. And because of all the rain that we've had, there's lots of little critters that are coming out onto the roads at night. Oi! And that's exactly what that spotted thickney was doing, was hoping to find its next meal. But sadly, not sticking around. Perhaps I disturbed it slightly, so maybe we'll just move away so it can come back and hunt. Hunt. Now, last night we saw one chasing after a bushfelt rain frog, which is quite funny. Bushfelt rain frogs are not built for speed whatsoever. So this thing was desperately trying to run because they don't hop like, uh, well, some of the other species uh, of frogs out there. And um, <laughs> so it was a stereotype. Desperately going, I can imagine it going, ah, as it was racing towards the gra grass to try and get some cover but it did it actually escaped to the beak of that spot of thickney they're also known to take on scorpions and solifuges and all sorts of creepy crawlies i just wish they'd eat more centipedes to be honest so the road's still nice and damp uh, for the minute i wonder what little critters we're going to see out here so i'm going to keep an eye out down on the ground to see what else we can find right everybody's got birds on the brain tonight including david Well, we've seen a big bird of prey here, and I'm not sure what it is. Um, trying to guess if it could be the brown snake eagle. I'm sure some of the viewers are very good in spotting them, and the moon is shining brightly on it. 
it looks like an hour, right? Oops, just took off. Went down, was looking down something there for something to eat. So we have Paul on the way. It looks like an owl. It looked like an owl. It looks like an eagle, but maybe it could have been an owl. I don't know if they had a good chance to have seen it. It just went right down there. I'm not sure it went to pick some food and they're going to come up. We might wait a few minutes and see. Most of these owls will always come out and get some mammals. Some will be hunting for bats at night that will come out or some large insects. It also looked like an owl. It had a big head. Eagle owl, yes, it's very possible. Could be the various eagle owl, maybe. I didn't see it very well, but very good. We think it was the various eagle owl, I mean an eagle owl. And this is the time they'll be more active coming out to feed on any night creatures like bats that will come out flying looking for food then they'll be fed on by the owls some large insects also the owls will also go for mammals very interesting because he was looking she was looking down there and she just dropped and we'll see whether she'll come up and let's find out what Raf could be searching for Well, still searching, still searching. We haven't seen any sign of Shudulu, so it's a mystery for now. What I have seen, however, was very uh, quickly I saw a black-backed jackal. And that's the first one that I've seen on Juma. Normally, they are quite, um, they're quite common and you find them all over the place and they're not normally very uh, skittish either. But for some reason, I find them, well, the, as I said, the first one that I found, ooh, there's little bush baby jumping through there it's always going to be difficult to spot there he goes there he goes oh, oh sorry behind the pole he's going to jump now Boink. there he goes there he is sorry about the pole sorry everyone there he is he's shiny his eyes are in there he goes on the pole hey. go forward a little bit go back Let's just go back quickly, see if we can spot him again. It's always difficult with the little bush babies. They are so quick and they jump so far. I think he's already come forward here. Let's see. Let's just have a quick check. There we go. That might be the last we see of him. They're so quick. Yeah. Ah, there he is. Oops. I don't know if you can see him there, Craig. Oh, there he's gone now. Where is he gone? There, he's still there. There he is. Twink, twink. Right up top now. It's a little lesser bush baby. There we go. Perfect. That's the, the nicest view I've had of one since I've been here. The one that's actually stayed still for the longest. Where's he gone? Oh, there he is. Still on the branch. Jumping there now. They are so agile, it's incredible. Jumping up to five meters, eh? He's on that branch there. There he is. That is very cool. And they do, um, if I'm not mistaken, they actually feed a lot on sap on the trees. So they'll bite a hole in the tree and then it sort of oozes the sap or the gum and they feed on that. Zora, these little uh, lesser bush babies, they make like a yee beep beep, yee beep beep, yee beep beep, choo, choo, choo. Tiny little calls like that. The thick-tailed bush baby is where the, the name actually comes from because they do like the tree dussy which is like ah, 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 like a crying baby but these little ones they've just got little chirps and squeaks there he is oh that's perfect that's the best little encounter i've had and he's not too worried about us now a nice distance between us but we can still see him nicely that is awesome See, you never know what you're going to find when you're out in the bush, hey? We've been looking for leopards, 
and Shudulu in particular, but this is the perfect way to end my drive. I'm very happy about that. Oh, it's big. That is so cool, a oh, little bush baby. And they do urinate on their hands and feet and then wipe it up there. You see, I think it might be eating little things there. They what, urinate hands and feet, and then they wipe it all where they go. Quite territorial, are they? Going around the branch. That is so awesome. Very happy with that. Now we are heading towards the end of the show, everybody, and what a way to finish it with this beautiful little bush baby doing his thing. But uh, there's been all sorts. And uh, it's been fantastic. So thanks to everybody involved. Thanks to the team. And uh, thanks to you, the viewers especially. And uh, please, we'll see you in the morning. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night and goodbye. <laughs>